This is Temple University's iCast, a new podcast through the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at TUJ. I'm here today with Leo Bosner. Leo is a longtime administrator at the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States. Now retired, I've known Leo through his work on Fukushima and crisis management in Japan. Leo, take, thanks for taking the time today. No, I'm, I'm glad, glad to do it. I'm uh, glad to help any way I can. Well, Leo, you have great insight on these issues because you've been dealing with these disaster response for so many years. Could you give us a, a brief overview of your background in FEMA? Yeah, just real briefly, FEMA's Federal Emergency Management Agency. I'm here in Washington, D.C., by the way, where I live. Uh, it's a federal agency in the U.S. that sort of manages uh, the response to disasters, hurricanes, and so on. Also does training, uh, supports mitigation, prevention against disasters, and so on. I worked there for about 29 years, from 79 until my retirement in 2008. And at one point, I was lucky enough to go to Japanese language school and then be assigned to work in Japan for a year to learn about their system and teach about ours. At that point, at some point there, I ran into Kyle and started doing some lecturing over at uh, Temple University of Japan. Since my retirement, I stayed interested in Japan and also in Taiwan, and I occasionally get to those countries when people when, when people are traveling. I get over there sometimes and do some various uh, lecturing on disaster issues. Mostly, I should clarify, disaster can be kind of widespread. I don't have any expertise, let's say, in construction engineering or building engineering against earthquakes. Mostly what I get involved in is the planning and preparedness for the response. How do you organize the government agencies, the nonprofits, the business sector, and so on to be able to respond effectively in case of a big disaster? Well, Leo, from your vantage point as a lifetime disaster management specialist, uh, just to not to put too sharp of a point on it, but why has the United States responded to this COVID crisis uh, so catastrophically bad? compared to other countries like Asia, I'm thinking about in particular, which has actually done quite well. I'd say, and I want to say this without bias or offending anybody, is our current U.S. president is a malicious idiot who could care less about the country (laughs) and just just wants to enrich himself and his colleagues. And I say that with with all due respect, of course. And quite seriously, the efficiency or the effectiveness of any government agency, and this is as simply as you can put it, depends in large part upon the quality of the chief executive or or in a private company as well. If you have a a private company building automobiles or building stereos or doing anything, and if the head of that company is incompetent, then the company is not going to run very well. Uh, The president appoints the head of FEMA. The president gives him the directions, tells him where to put the priorities and so on. And so FEMA for responding to a disaster or CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Department of Health and Human Services. All these agencies depend on the orders they're getting, the authorities they're getting, and so on, from the chief executive of the government. But that's where it comes down to. In the current situation, um, I, I can't, well, I really can't believe much of anything coming out of the government right now because there's been a lot of, well, there's been flat out lies, there's been misleading statements, from the president, one day we're doing this, the next day we're doing that. He's told people you could uh, try drinking various toxic substances to kill the virus in your body, uh, maybe put an ultraviolet light in your mouth or something like this. In this kind of situation, you can't expect that the agencies beneath that president are all going to be running like clockwork because he's going to wind up hiring people and putting them in charge of this, these agencies who are going to be his political buddies, who are going to be yes men and yes women or whatever. And they're just going to follow his lead. And if Mr. Trump says everything's going great, the response is going wonderfully, and then you go to the FEMA head and say, so how's the response going? He's going to say, man, the response is going great. The response is going wonderfully because he's taking his cue, his cues from the president. Uh, the president didn't act, the U.S. government didn't act quickly enough when the virus first came out. There was a whole, I understand there was a whole playbook, a whole plan sitting on the shelf in the White House saying, here's what to do with this pandemic, which they ignored. So they didn't set up border controls in time. They didn't emphasize the testing or anything else in time. They turned away American companies that wanted to produce masks in volume uh, when the pandemic first reared its head. 
but the people running the government agencies said no, we're not really that interested. So the fellow at that company either, I read about a couple of them, one company just didn't bother activating their assembly line. The other company started selling their masks to China because China did, did want the masks. So all of a sudden we had a mask shortage. Uh, like I could spend the whole hour just going through all the screw ups we've had here. Um, mm -hmm. But they've, they've been they've been from the start to finish. And in, in part, it's going to be corruption. And in part, it's going to be a president or a governor, or any chief executive is hiring people to top jobs just based on political friendship or based on their ability to make money by contracting things with companies and things. Uh, those people are not going to be real competent and real sharp at doing the kinds of things that they need to be doing. So in one news article I saw, there's an American, American manufacturer who saw this coming way back in January or February, kept bugging the government to say, look, I have a factory line here. It's sitting idle. He owns several factories that produce various kinds of things. I can set this up to start producing masks for you. I can do them, I think he said, for like 50 cents a piece or something like this. And they ignored him. They ignored him completely. He never activated his line. And then when they finally did start gearing up for masks, the government will hire contractors to go and they'd hire somebody to go and try to find a factory or find some place that can make masks. And there's been some scandals about this at one company they hired, which had no experience in this whatsoever, which had already had bankruptcy proceedings against it. They hired them and this company managed to go out and find a place that would sell the government masks for five dollars a piece. So having turned down the guy who wanted to sell directly uh, to the government, sell masks for 50 cents a piece. Instead, they found a contractor who they paid to find another company that would sell the government masks for five dollars a piece. And those figures probably aren't accurate. It was exact, precise. There's a few pennies either way. But when that kind of stuff is going on, you know, nothing, nothing is going to work very well. And if you're going to ask me what's FEMA doing right now, I couldn't really tell you because Again, very truthfully speaking, I can't I can't put any reliable any reliability or any faith right now in any announcements whatsoever coming out of the U.S. government. The only person I can believe in the government is Dr. Fauci. I'll listen carefully to what he says, and if, uh, God bless him for hanging in there. If he says, "Hey, keep your distance, wear a mask, and wash your hands a lot," that's what I'm going to do. Below him, uh, it's going to depend on the whims of the president. Can he get a better deal? in trade with China. Can you get something over here? And then those announcements are going to follow uh, what he wants to do politically. Well, mm -hmm. One of the um, medicines he's been pushing, one of, one of the many sort of voodoo medicines he's pushed, it turns out that a senior staffer, either on Trump's staff, or Trump's staff or Pence's staff, owns major stock in their company. So it's like you're just in a total swamp of corruption, corruption and incompetence here. So they all keep wearing a mask and keep them at distance. Mm -hmm. Well, Leo, one of the insights that you bring to this is that you had worked with FEMA through a number of different presidential administrations. Um, if we were to try to make the most benign interpretation of what's happened in the United States, I suppose it would be something along the lines of at a disaster of this scale, it's beyond the scope of any organization to really deal with it. I think we saw this in Fukushima, that just the the complexity of the disaster was such that it defied the control of any particular organization. But if you look back over your long history of dealing with disasters, when did it actually work? When was the government competent in its response to a major disaster? Mostly, I, I, and I'll back up to the other thing. It's it's not beyond the capability to deal with these large disasters, as effect, I'll say as effectively as possible. Let me back up a little bit here, because I got this question once when I was lecturing in Japan. Is there some point when FEMA was actually working well, they'd say, well, is there some point that the FEMA system is going to break down? And I'll say, well, yeah, of course. The FEMA system that we developed there does not add any new resources necessarily into the mix. It tries to use them as effectively as possible. And this becomes important. Going back to a real quick example of Fukushima that you mentioned, uh, Japan developed uh, medical teams after the 1995 Hanshin earthquake in Kobe, near Kobe Prefecture, I should say, to deal with disasters. But they made some mistakes. Is number one is the teams would were trained almost exclusively to deal with earthquake medical issues such as crush injuries and nothing for uh, drown, uh, near drownings or water inhalation or 
hypothermia and things that people would have after a tsunami. And secondly, they didn't have a very good way of managing where these teams were actually going to go and operate out in the field. So when the, the disaster hit, and I, I interviewed a number of these docs afterwards, they were frustrated. Well, the two things that happened were, number one, so all these doctor teams had wonderful equipment and training and meds and everything for people being crushed by earthquakes, buildings falling down and so on. They didn't have much with them to deal with people suffering from the tsunami effects, which was it inhaling and swallowing a lot of bad stuff because they've been stuck in the water, things like that. It wouldn't happen during an earthquake. The second thing that happened was there was not much of a plan for staying in touch and communicating and managing these teams once they'd all headed out the door and jumped in the vehicles and driven off to wherever. The other people in charge lost touch with them. So in some cases, you might have, you know, five medical teams or a number of medical teams all showing up at the same town. Or another town a few kilometers away that they had medical teams, nobody went there because they didn't have a good system to say, OK, you go to this town, you go to this town, you go to this town, et cetera. Um, it's a matter of me. It's a matter of managing to use those resources as effectively as you can. So mm -hmm. what the what the government can do, in my view, is before the disaster, work through these issues, do some realistic planning and training, realistic exercises, assessments of what's going to happen and then try to make the plans as best as possible. And then when the disaster occurs, manage the resources so that they're being used as effectively as possible. Right. And uh, for some good examples, okay, when FEMA worked well, and I know this is gonna sound political, but going back to the presidents, from my experience, FEMA worked the best under the two most recent Democratic presidents we had, uh, Bill Clinton and then Barack Obama. In both cases, these fellows appointed a couple of top-notch people to run FEMA. Clinton appointed James Lee Witt, uh, Obama appoint, uh, appointed Craig Fugate. And then they gave them they gave them the power. They said, go ahead and do this, make the plans, do everything right, make things happen correctly. So one example I use sometimes, again, in 1995, uh, there was a big terrorist incident in Oklahoma City where some right-wing American terrorist type people blew up a gigantic truck bomb in front of a federal building, tore the building like in half, all sorts of casualties, all sorts of problems. People may be trapped in the building. Search and rescue is needed. This happened obviously totally without warning. Within 30 minutes, uh, the FEMA office in Texas, the FEMA regional office was in a conference call with the state of Oklahoma and with the Oklahoma City authorities within 30 minutes to find out, okay, what happened? What do you guys need? How are we going to do this? And they'd done these things before in practice. They had these calls before. So everybody knew each other. It wasn't who are you and what can you do? It was, okay, I know who you are. I know what resources you have. Here's what we're going to have to do. The biggest need they discovered, they said, was search and rescue teams, specialized search and rescue to try to help go through the buildings that had been knocked down and look for any survivors. And FEMA had trained search and rescue teams on their way to Oklahoma City from around the country within two hours. And I mean, within, on the way, I mean, they had their equipment, they were on buses, they were arriving at military airports. The military understood that they would be tasked to have all these civilian firefighters and medics get onto their planes and fly in military planes to get to Oklahoma City. They arrived in Oklahoma City quickly. They were able to help in search and rescue efforts. Uh, by that time, in fact, a lot of it was body recovery because the people had died so so quickly in that bombing. But the fact of the matter is you had a fairly smooth, very quick response. And the opposite happened under the Bush administration in Hurricane Katrina, where they had two days warning, at least that this hurricane was coming in. It wasn't like the terrorist bomb. They had 48 hours warning. But the right. people running FEMA and Homeland Security really, they weren't, didn't have the background. They didn't know what to do. Uh, the well, guy run, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, let's, let's slow down there a little bit. What, sure. what was your role at the time of the Katrina hurricane disaster in New Orleans? Yeah, what I did by that point, I was fairly senior. That was getting close to the time when I'd be retiring. I retired in 2008. I had 29 years in there and this was 2005. Um, I was what they would call a watch officer. We have a 24-hour office at FEMA. We did back then, there would be 12-hour shifts in the day, 12-hour shifts at night, monitoring everything going on around the country and issuing strong warnings of anything that was coming in that looked like a disaster. So 
I was on the night shift, and on the night shift, what we did was we would produce a morning report at 5.30 a.m. Eastern time that went out to everybody. It was called the National Situation Report. They went to FEMA, the heads of FEMA, Homeland Security, the Pentagon, the Red Cross, all, all across the board at 5.30 a.m., giving them a heads up on any, <clears throat> any ongoing disaster activities, but also anything that looked dangerous coming in. And my team... I had a couple of weather forecasters and some other people in there working for me. Uh, we could see this hurricane was coming in. The weather service had put warnings out. We took the weather service warnings and then matched them up with basically the geography and the demographics for the area that was going to get hit. And the biggie was New Orleans, which had a very dense, densely populated city and also a city where a lot of people didn't own cars. In, in a lot of big cities, people don't own cars. Uh, they take buses, they take subways, they walk to work, whatever. And a lot of them are low income people who don't have cars as well. And we looked at the numbers and looked at the problems and put in our report very strongly at 5.30 a.m. Two days before the hurricane hit, the hurricane hit Monday morning. We did this on Friday night into Saturday morning before putting a very strong warning to the government had saying, look, here's this hurricane. Here's the map. Here's the hurricane. You can see it. Here's a dotted line showing it's going straight for New Orleans. Here's the demographics on New Orleans. You got to evacuate people. You got to set up feeding centers, shelters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And nothing happened. We came in the next day thinking all this action was going to take place. And we see, oh, well, we're standing by, we're standing by. Standing by, it's like you're in the middle of the street and a truck's heading right for you. Hey, buddy, get out of the way. Well, I'm, I'm assessing the situation. Because, oh, why is that? Well, President Bush had put, okay, I'll go back to President Clinton. President Clinton put James Lee Witt in charge of FEMA, who was an experienced disaster manager, who was very strong and very aggressive and assertive on dealing with disasters. When Bush was elected president, the FEMA director job was seen as kind of a throwaway job. Uh, the first director, I, I'm blanking on his name under Bush, had been Bush's campaign manager. And I learned later, I was told from pretty high up authorities, the reason he got the FEMA job was because he worked at the White House and he and a couple of other people were always getting into arguments. And the people at the White House didn't like having all these arguments. They said, well, let's send these guys out to other agencies. Well, huh? hey, send this guy over to FEMA. So whoever that guy was, Joe Elbow, A-L-L-B-A-U-E-G-H. Yeah, he was the campaign manager, didn't know anything about disasters. He came to FEMA and he left after a couple of years. He was replaced by Mike Brown, who was a lawyer who also didn't know anything about disasters. And we we're under Homeland Security, which was headed by Michael Chertoff, who also didn't know anything about disasters. So I start telling you all these people were in charge who didn't know anything about disasters. Well, gee, surprise, surprise, they didn't do much. So after the, the hurricane hit, FEMA did almost nothing to prepare for it or to start moving on it. The hurricane hit, there were people trapped there. They were stuck on rooftops. They didn't have anywhere to go, et cetera. After that point, all I could do and the other people I worked with is we became the information reporting team that tried to get all the information from the field and make sure the people at headquarters knew what was going on so they could, the district, different agencies could send out the relief and could manage it as best as possible. Uh, and the agencies, the Coast Guard and the Forest Service, uh, which, which has a lot of rescue teams as well, these people did a good, as good job as they could afterwards. But it's like, it's like waiting until you've been hit by the truck and you're bleeding out of 40 places and saying, well, try to fix this guy up as best you can. OK, but wouldn't it have been better to have gotten out of the way of the truck in the first place? So right. after after that, we we're playing catch up. And what I did personally was manage a team. This is after the hurricane hit. Then I had about a 10 person team in there managing them to get all the information in on the time in a very timely way. Get it to the people in the agencies who are running things. So they'd know what was going on. So if one guy here is uh, maybe he's planning on resupply for medical teams, we make sure we find from the health department, where are your medical teams? Are any of them moving? Are they going someplace else? What's their status? Make sure the guy over here who's giving supplies to the medical teams knows about that. It's, it, that's not the best way I can probably describe it. Yeah, well, what I found remarkable about the Katrina hurricane is just how at every level, the federal level, the state level, the local level. I think the mayor of New Orleans was eventually indicted for corruption. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen actually PBS Frontline has a documentary um, about the Katrina hurricane, and you're quoted in that. <clears throat> also, you've written a couple of long form pieces on the website Truth Out mm -hmm. um, about your experience and your insight in that. 
But what it seemed to me is that there was just a lack of coordination between these various levels of government. And that's something that, you know, we've talked about and we saw certainly in Fukushima. So what's your assessment? I mean, you came on a Mansfield Fellowship. You learned some Japanese. You came over here to Japan and I do, you did a lot of intensive interviews and research. And then subsequent to that, you've come back several times. So what was your insight and your view of the way Japan dealt with the Tohoku disasters of March 2011? Well, I think what I saw at the, from the Tohoku disaster and other incidents there is that the frontline responders in Japan, from what I can see, are absolutely excellent. Uh, the firefighters, the medics, the self-defense force, if they're called in, the, the police departments, the nonprofit groups. These people, man, I have a great admiration for them. I really do, because by and large, there's probably exceptions in there, but by and large, I do. These people are highly dedicated. They're very hardworking. They really care about getting in there and doing the job. Their equipment is generally quite good. Uh, the vehicles and stuff that I've seen in the fire departments in Japan are generally, in my opinion, way superior to the ones we have here in the U.S. They have great stuff. All the equipment's there, the people there, et cetera. The problem is, Getting back to that issue of the management, this is where I see Japan, the whole thing just falling apart. And the way I described this was that I said in one of the papers I wrote was that Japan does not have a system for responding to disasters. There are a whole bunch of individual systems. The fire department has their system, the medics have their system, the police have their system. But from the government's point of view, it seems to be, well, if the big disaster happens, then let's get those people together and hope they all work together well. And it's not a matter of hostility, but it's a matter of these people have to know what the other ones are doing. Like what radio frequency do you use? What kind of fuel do you need for your vehicles? Where are you going to be and where are we going to be? That part has been totally dropped by the Japanese government. It was dropped in 1995 at Kobe and it's been dropped ever since, as far as I can tell. Um, Famously, one of the examples of that is that when the Tokyo Metropolitan Fire Department arrived at the site and tried to plug in, these diesel-driven um, trucks that would put high volumes of water, they, they didn't have the right kind of connector. Uh, and just the most fundamental thing. See, that that's the kind of thing that the Japanese system has avoided. They've they've avoided facing up to that. And it's, it's really frustrating to me because I really like Japan. I've got a lot of Japanese friends there. I love the place and everything. But for whatever, it's a mixture of maybe cultural reasons, political reasons, turf issues. I'll give my little armchair psychology here. Is, is In my opinion, the Japanese culture places a huge emphasis on personal responsibility. If you're supposed to do something, go ahead and get it done. But the bad side of that is, is you're not paying a lot of attention to what the other guy's doing. But, well, that's his business over there. So just to put this in real terms, when I was at FEMA, was spent a lot of money and a lot of time and effort all all the time when there's no disaster on doing all kinds of training and guidance materials for state government people, for local government people, for fire departments, for all, all these people in the disaster. We had training courses. We had a training center for these non-federal people, state and local people, nonprofits. They could come there for training for like one and two week training courses. It was free. We'd even give them the plane tickets. We'd let them stay there for free, no tuition. Everything was good because at FEMA, we understood that, yeah, we're the federal government, but we're going to be, you know, the first responders are not us. The first responders are going to be the local ambulance, the local fire, then maybe the state government. So we're coming in after the fact. And number one is we want these people at that local level doing the best job possible. And number two is we want them to be able to interact with us when we ask them, what do you need? They're going to know what to tell us, etc. So it had to be a whole system there that we did. Well, when I was going around after the Tohoku earthquake, uh, I was able to get a, a six-week research fellowship to go to Japan the following year in January 2012 and interview a whole lot of people. And at one point, I was interviewing a guy in the central Japan in the national government office who dealt with disasters there. And he was a very bright young guy. His English was good because my Japanese is limited. And he's explaining, here's what we do here, here's what we do there, here's what we do here. And at some point I asked him, I said, now, I'm curious in Japan, for the prefectural government people and the local government people, where do they get their training and their planning and their guidebooks and so on for how to deal with disasters? 
And he looked at me and just shrugged his shoulders and said, I don't know. I mean, to him, that was probably really a kind of an absurd question. He's in the national government. How should he know where the cities get their information? How should he know where the prefectures get their information? That's their responsibility, not his. Mm. But we understand a theme is theoretically that might be okay to say. But in the real disaster, if those people don't have good plans, and if their plans don't fit together and fit together with yours, you're going to have a mess on your hands, even just trying to decide where are you and who is where and who do we contact and who has the authority to do such and such. But in, in the Japan situation, what I saw was this national government guy was so intently focused, intently focused on what his office was going to do in the disaster. And by golly, he was doing the best he could. But if you said, what about the people you're working with? What kind of training do they have? I don't know. That's that's their problem, except it's going to be your problem when the disaster comes. Well, do you think that's changed? Because what you're talking about basically is a lack of professionalization in which people have had specialized training for disaster management. And I assume I may be, correct me if I'm wrong, but the kind of people you're dealing with in the United States, like yourself, you were a FEMA lifer. I mean, mm -hmm. you must have had a lot of training and there, there is a kind of a professional skill set and an identity associated with that. Whereas in Japan, it just seems like you have, you know, very, maybe very bright, very sincere, very dedicated people, but they're not specialists in the field. And moreover, they float from one organization <clears throat> to the other every few years. So there's no continuity in the expertise. Yeah, that you're exactly correct. And that that's a major problem that I see in Japan is, yeah, I was at FEMA for almost 29 years. But remember, first of all, disasters don't happen every day. So let's say if you work in the post office delivering mail or doing something like, you know, maintaining a system there. Well, if you screw it up, people are going to start yelling at you the next day and say, hey, my, the mail went to the wrong place. Or this didn't, oh, gee, we better fix it. We better fix it. So you're going to gain your experience really quickly. But disasters don't happen every day. So you might be there a couple of years and there's no big disaster. So you go to training, go to exercise, et cetera. But to gain the experience, to really start knowing more about the ins and outs and how it works and what to do and what not to do is going to take you a few years because you have to wait a few years of these different disasters. You're working to really apply all that stuff you learned in the training courses and really handle yeah. it correctly. The difficulty is that I this came in after a while. OK, I was at FEMA for 29 years. The people in Japan, as far as I can figure at every government level, automatically rotate jobs every two years to a new agency. They just leave completely. Whatever they did in disaster stuff, they leave and they go someplace else. So all those people in Japan who worked in the national government during the Tohoku disaster and probably gained immense practical experience, well, after a couple of years, they were all gone to other ministries someplace and they never maybe work on disasters again ever. So that knowledge was lost. But the civil servant systems or the civil service systems in a way, are totally opposite. I was at FEMA for 29 years, as I mentioned. Now, people, civil servants in the U.S. sometimes change agencies and move around. And if you're really like a super brain type of person, that can work for you maybe. But for most of us in the U.S., government employees, the path to advancement is to find an agency you want to work with and stay there. Because the more you learn about it, the more expertise you're gaining, you're moving up, you're moving up, you're moving up. So I started at FEMA when the agency started in 79. Uh, things weren't real great in the 80s. There was still a lot of confusion in the agency, but by the 90s, things were picking up. So I stayed there. I worked, like, uh, did information stuff at the Oklahoma, uh, information and reporting for the Oklahoma City bombing. I worked in the field a couple of times after hurricanes, did a lot of training, been through exercises. So little by little, my expertise would build up. And this translated for me into promotions to higher pay levels. Well, in Japan, from what I'm understanding, it's the exact opposite. That if by some fluke, you hang on and stay in the same agency for a long time, you're considered deadwood. You're, you're considered you're a loser. You didn't have what it takes to advance the Japanese civil servant must keep moving from one agency to another. And I don't know how why they judge it that way, but they do. So. If anybody stayed in disaster management or managed to somehow cling to it for 29 years in Japan, I think they look at him like he was nuts. Like, buddy, you're never going to get ahead that way. Mm -hmm. So because of that, they just don't gain the practical experience, which is, is really frustrating. I, I've been going to Japan now. Let's say my first trip there was to for lecturing was in 
I want to say in November of 1996. In yeah, November of 1996, so that's 23 years. I've been going back and forth since. Over that time, I've made a lot of long-time professional contacts in Japan, uh, in the medical profession, in the self-defense force, the military side, in some in the fire service, some in academia, and some in the nonprofit sector. None in government. Zero. I have no contacts in Japan government because every time I go, the guy I worked with the last time is gone. He left. Right. Right. So that, you, that is very frustrating. When you talk to my, I mean, you've been very generous over the years in talking to my classes several times. And even when I was a visiting professor at Gettysburg College, you lectured there outside D.C. And last time we talked about this, I found it surprising that this seems to happen, this lack of continuity um, and the lack of a skill set that transfers. It's something that happens at every level of government. My understanding, based on my research of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, was that in the ministries, the head of the ministries would move every few years. And so as a result, by the time they've gone through a learning curve, they've moved on and they don't carry that expertise with them. But uh, just to give an example of this, uh, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this, but um, one of the big scandals in the early <coughs> days of the Fukushima nuclear disaster was there was a consequence analysis um, technology called Speedy, which was a kind of atmospheric um, analysis system. It was a plume projection model, and it was you could use it for pollution. In this case, it's being used for uh, a nuclear plume. It had been developed after the Three Mile Island incident, and then particularly after Chernobyl in 1986. So they had supercomputers. They had a couple of billion yen of investment in this. This whole organization for m monitoring compiling radiation data to be used for protective action guidelines. So in the case of a nuclear disaster, you know you know where the wind's blowing, you know what the consequences might be to steer people away from that. And they never used it. And as I was doing interviews on this, I talked with Ryu Hayano, who was the head of the Department of Physics at Tokyo University. He you know, is a very sophisticated nuclear scientist, and so he was trying to get information on this. And because you know, he's in an elite position at Todai. He contacted some friends of the government. And he said, hey, can you send me the speedy data? Because I want to do a plume projection analysis. Um, he had a friend, former student who worked with Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, and they were going to work on this together. And then when he contacted the ministry, they didn't know what he's talking about. Now, this was the agency, it's called MEX, that's responsible for radiation assessment within the government. Mm -hmm. And when they went to the minister, his name is Suzuki, and asked him about how Speedy was being used and could they get the data from Speedy, the minister of Mex, Suzuki, he had no idea what he was talking about. And his assistants said, well, give us a day or two. And they kind of looked around. And they said, yeah, actually, we have this data, but we're not using it. And what I found remarkable, about, well, first of all, it's remarkable that the head of the organization responsible for this doesn't even know what their main technology is. But secondly, when I did secondary interviews on this and talked to people about this, just kind of being shocked and outraged about it, the Japanese contacts that I had within the government, everyone kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, yeah, yeah, what do you expect? But they weren't surprised whatsoever. And they said, well, how could he know? Because within two or three years, he's going to be gone. So, you know, um, you would think I had assumed that as a result, the mid-level management or people lower down the food chain kind of were more hands-on. But what you were telling me last time is that this happens throughout the entire political bureaucracy, that not only do the ministers move as kind of this, you know, revolving chairs every couple of years, but that also happens at virtually every level of the organization. Yes, correct. And and I'm not I'm not surprised, disappointing, but I'm not surprised. Uh, now, in the U.S. government, agency heads do change over. Uh, like the head of FEMA is appointed by the president, so that changes every presidential administration. But when it's done right, the person who the president appoints to that job is going to be somebody who's already spent maybe several years at a state level or at a local level doing disaster management work. So when Craig, when Obama, President Obama appointed Craig Fugate to head FEMA in 2009, when the Obama administration started, Craig Fugate had been the Florida 
state, the state of Florida disaster manager for years in their state government. And Florida, of course, has the hurricanes, they have the floods, they have fires, things like this. So Craig had been doing this kind of work at the state level for years. So he could walk into the job and say, OK, now I'll do this at the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, every president hasn't necessarily followed that. The, the, the Bushes certainly didn't. The Bushes, just Bush Sr. and Bush Jr., just basically appointed people like, well, I don't know, this guy wants the job in the government, send him over to FEMA. They didn't seem to really bother much one way or the other about it. I, I can't get into the thinking on that. Um, Trump. But you had said, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, but you had said that one of the reasons that the Katrina hurricane disaster response played out the way that it did is that FEMA had basically been co-opted by the Department of Homeland Security after the 2001 terrorist attacks. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. What happened was a FEMA, when I first came there and until 2003, I guess, FEMA was an independent agency that reported directly to the president or to a person directly on the president's staff or the, you know, right, up, right up there at that level. When the disaster, the terrorist incident hit, in 2001, there was a big worry about terrorism. We have to do more for terrorism. Well, at the same time, in the war on terror, invade Iraq or Afghanistan or some other country, at the same time, Bush, George W. Bush there, had been elected. And his big promise before terrorism hit was, I'm going to cut taxes. We're going to lower the taxes down, lower taxes, lower taxes. So now he's faced that he wants to do this big war on terror. But where you can get the money, you have to pay salaries to the staff people. There's cost to putting an agency together. So when you put Homeland Security together, they pulled away a lot of the budget out of FEMA and some of the people out of FEMA and sent them over to Homeland Security. So FEMA became, uh, well, I worked in an office that was working on federal disaster planning. And if somebody retired or left, they went to Homeland Security or retired. In the old days, we would have hired a new person. Well, now we couldn't, no budget to hire a new person. So that 10 person planning team became a non -per nine person team. Then later it became an eight person team and so on. And as each person left, the workload on the others got worse and they all want to bail and go someplace else. So FEMA was cannibalized more and more. And at the same time, when, Ho when Homeland Security was established then and FEMA came under it, there seemed to be an organizational, either an indifference or a hostility toward FEMA from the people at Homeland Security, at least at the political levels, not, maybe not at the staff level too much, but their whole mindset is we're here to fight the terrorists and FEMA, I don't know, they do floods or something like this. And they didn't get it. Uh, I was sitting in, I'm, I was sitting in a university class and somebody was giving a talk very early on here. And this person said, now you have to understand Homeland Security deals with disasters and FEMA deals with natural disasters. Or, uh, Homeland Security deals with terrorism, FEMA deals with natural disasters. And I had to sort of politely jump in and say, wait, excuse me, you're wrong. Uh, I was at FEMA when the Oklahoma City terrorist bombing took place. And FEMA jumped in right away and sent in search and rescue teams to help look, look for the uh, survivors. And we monitored what was going on. And the person said, well, that's not what I meant. And I said, I know that's not what you meant, but that's what you said. FEMA does not go in with guns and badges to try to capture the terrorist. You're right. But FEMA does come in to try to get search and rescue or medical treatment or any kind of relief, let's say, for the victims of terrorism and for fixing up after the terrorism event, because the terrorism event in this case was a collapsed building. Well, a year before, there'd been an earthquake in California with collapsed buildings and our search and rescue teams went to the collapsed buildings to help out. And a year later, when the collapsed building was from a terrorist bomb, the same search and rescue teams went there. That's the all hazard planning model. But the people didn't get this at home in security. They said, you guys go play with your floods. We'll deal with terrorism. So there wasn't much interaction. There wasn't much information going back and forth. Well, so when Katrina came, you had a bunch of people at Homeland Security who were over and above FEMA. But the guys at Homeland Security didn't know anything about disasters. So they're trying to issue orders and do things, not having a clue what they're doing. So it seemed we were kind of stuck. We did the best we could. Something like that happened in the Toka disasters. where You had politicians who were intervening. And, you know, Prime Minister Nato Khan at the time had come under a lot of criticism for micromanaging the disaster. I think in the case of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, he was really key in making sure that some of the proper corrective mitigation actions were taken. But th there were a lot of people who were very confident, like, you know, in the Tokyo Metropolitan Fire Department or the people you mentioned that 
had initially started with the tsunami disaster response, they were really quite competent. But it seemed like there was just a lack of connection, a lack of coordination between the local, prefectural, and state level. So I interviewed mayors and politicians in Tohoku, and they were just bitterly critical of the way the government had founded it. There's, there's a famous case of the mayor of uh, Manami Soma, Mayor Sakurai. This was a town that was, part of it was evacuated, it was kind of on the boundary of the evacuation zones. It had been hit by both the tsunami and later um, we had evacuees from the nuclear disaster. And the mayor of Manami Soma famously went on YouTube. Now this is two weeks after the disaster had started and was pleading for help to get food, to get fuel, to get anything because they were being ignored from by the by the federal government. And I think a lot of people just found this shocking because you would think that in every aspect of the culture, things seem to be very functional. It's kind of a clockwork kind of system in Japan where everything works so well. There was an incident about a year ago, year and a half, where a train leaving out of Osaka, it might have been in Nagoya, it left, 50, it was a Shinkansen train, bullet train. It left 15 seconds early. And the president of the JR train system went on national television and deeply apologized for inconveniencing people. <laughs> if you can compare that, you know, to right. the United States or, or the European train system. So you would think of any country that things would work, it would be here. But it, it seemed like um, a lot of people are very much out of their depth. And one thing that I think is really important is that, OK, I mean, obviously what's happening in American politics, it, it's pretty hard not to you know, shoot the fish in the barrel there when you're dealing with the federal government and a person like Trump on top of that. But these bureaucrats and these politicians, these people responding, they do their best. You know, they're sincere and they feel very much besieged when they're critiqued after the fact for not being up to the task. But it's not really a matter of sincerity or how hard people work. It's whether or not they have the proper training. And, I, and it seems like they didn't. Well, that's exactly correct. The training and a system. This, this is where... You know, when I when I see the reports of Prime Minister Khan running around doing all this thing, I almost think to myself, the example I think is imagine if there was a big fire in, in Tokyo and you look out and there's the mayor of Koike or whatever her name is there. There's the mayor of Little Helmet on sending the firefighters around to do the thing. I might be inclined to say, well, mayor, that's very brave of you. But where's the fire chief? Well, I didn't hire one. We don't have a fire chief. Wait, hey, wait a second. It's not good enough for the mayor to be brave and get out there and run things. The mayor before the fire has to hire a good fire chief to make sure things are running well. And that system type level thinking just doesn't seem to have hit home in Japan, where after the disaster, there's problems that comes to be, well, we need better trucks and we need better radios or better whatever it is. And those are just not the issues. The issues are the lack of the training and planning, but it's also the lack of a system that encourages and allows people to stay in for a long time. Uh, I'll just mention this when um, mm -hmm. when I was at FEMA on the disaster teams, and I mentioned we would have 12-hour uh, shifts. You work from seven to seven day or seven to seven night. And then when your shift is over, you go home and go to sleep. I would get off my, my shift was a night shift from seven at night till seven in the morning. In the morning, I would brief my day, daytime counterpart coming in to run things. I'd go home, man, I'm out of there. Don't ask me any more stuff. I go home, as I always said in the morning, I go home and have a beer and a bagel, and then I go to sleep during the day, and then wake up and go in later. And once a week or once every 10 days or so, even with that, we would get a couple of nights off or a couple of days off to rest up. We'd bring in some other people. We had enough people trained, so we'd keep rotating through. Well, I did that for two months, because we had Hurricane Katrina, and then there was Hurricane Rita, and then there was Hurricane Wilma, and I think there was another one there, too. There were a bunch of hurricanes that came back to back. A lot of people don't realize that. So I did that for two months. Well, the Japanese don't do that. The Japanese guys I talked to from their Naikaku Fubo Saitanto, these are real hardcore guys. Man, we worked around the clock. We worked without sleep. And I'm thinking, yeah. If you went, I don't care that Yamato spirit or Yamate spirit, if you went for more than 24 hours out of sleep, your head was hitting the desk. I don't care about the Japanese fighting spirit. And you were making bad decisions and not knowing what was going on. You were exhausted. Moreover, mm -hmm. moreover, those people, after that's over with, at least a couple that I've talked with, when they're going to rotate out, I say, well, maybe you can work disasters in the future with your experience. And they look at me and say, man, I never hear, I, I never want to hear about disasters again as long as I live. 
because the Japanese system uses those people. Yeah, we can do it. We'll work 24 hours a day. We'll go without sleep. We'll go without food, blah, blah, blah. They burn their people out. They burn them out. So even those people that work the Tohoku disaster in, in the government in Japan, they're so burned out by this. They never want to do this stuff again. Where me, where I had 12-hour shifts and then go home and watch a little TV, have a beer, sleep for a while, and go back in for my next shift. Yeah, I could do that disaster for two months, and I could do FEMA for 29 years because I'm not getting burned out. And that's part of this. That's one aspect, one of many aspects of developing a system to use your people effectively and use your resources effectively in a large disaster. And the systemic thinking just isn't there. I'll add one more thing to get politicians to do anything in any country. There has to be an incentive and there has to be maybe a punishment. And the main reason or a big reason why FEMA got to be as good as at least as it was for a while. During the 80s, FEMA was kind of a waste, quite frankly. The whole thing was all about nuclear civil defense, nuclear attack from the Russians and stuff. In the summer, right around Labor Day, right around September, I forget the exact date of 1992, Hurricane Andrew, major devastating hurricane, hit Florida. FEMA had been doing diddly on planning. FEMA's whole planning mindset was something with nuclear attacks, nothing else. So this hurricane hit Florida. FEMA was sitting on their butts. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody had any plans. Nobody had anything. It was an absolute mess. As it happened, the presidential elections were two months later, and that was when George Bush Sr. was running for re-election, which people thought he was going to get re-elected, and he didn't. Bill Clinton beat him and won that election. And a lot of people said, you know, partly that was because FEMA and the government did such a lousy job in Florida after Hurricane Andrew, and it was still fresh in people's minds. So the Clinton people coming in said, man, we got to fix this because otherwise the same thing's going to happen to us. So that's mm -hmm. when they hired James Lee Witt, and that's when FEMA really started getting up and running. But the Japanese political system doesn't have quite that much of a system to punish or reward a prime minister or we haven't got a president, an executive in government for doing a good job or a bad job. They can kind of, well, Khan, OK, we'll get him out with the LDP in. But it never really connects with they have to do a better job on this particular thing. So the system keeps struggling. Well, having done research in Japan and come over here and both given lectures and done interviews, do you feel that following the 2011 disasters that lessons have been learned and integrated into the institutional structures and the crisis management protocols? Uh, I haven't done that much research since then. I got over there a few times, actually. My answer would be no. Uh, several yeah, that's years. That's my impression as well. Yeah, several years after, I have a quick example. Of, this must have been two or three years after Tohoku. It must have been 2014, 15, around in there. I was over in Tokyo doing some different interviews. I'm interviewing this one fellow in one of the Japanese ministries. And he's a smart guy, very frustrated in his job, though. His job was to plan for fuel fuel supplies for emergency vehicles in a big disaster because uh, the ambulances, the fire trucks, the military, the police, oh, they're going to need gasoline or diesel or whatever for their vehicles to go and help in the disaster. His job is to plan all the fuel, how much fuel is needed, where it should be maybe pre-located, et cetera, for the disaster. But he was very frustrated because he knew full well that several blocks away in a different government ministry, there was another guy who was planning for the vehicles themselves. How many fire trucks, how many ambulances, how many police cars, military trucks, etc. Where will they be? And these two guys were not supposed to talk to each other. I don't know. If, it wasn't clear if they were forbidden to or just really, really shouldn't do that. I'm not well, kidding, I, Kyle. So no, that's guy, possible. I, have a, I shouldn't his, name names, but I have a, a friend who actually used to work at the university. Her husband, she's Japanese. Her husband is American. And he works in IT. And she was telling me that he is not allowed to speak to the person sitting next to him unless he gets permission from the supervisor to do so. And the supervisor doesn't work in the same building. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, so. it's part, part, part of that to me comes back to the idea of personal responsibility that to talk to this other person is almost like if, imagine if you're a student taking an exam in college and you say, Jesus, you know, you're all sitting there for this big exam and saying, you say, I mean, this one question is tough. I'm going to walk across the exam room and ask my buddy over there, what do you think the answer is? Hey, sit down. You, you can't do that. That's mm -hmm. cheating. That's mm -hmm. asking somebody else to give you the answers. And unfortunately, that's still the mindset 
these government offices. You can't ask somebody else to help you on this. This is your job. Go and do it. And in real terms, that turns out to be really, really dumb. You know, it's ironic because I think what ends up happening here is that the organizational structures and processes are so overbuilt that they become very difficult to manage outside of, of just kind of a routine, ritualized kind of way. So when mm -hmm. you have a disaster and things become chaotic, and it's really important that people communicate, they step outside their lane, they start making decisions, if not spontaneously, then kind of as is necessary, the system just doesn't allow it. It boxes them in so much that they have a really hard time dealing with it. I had some interns that did re research up in Tohoku, and they found that at the height of the evacuations, in that same town I mentioned, Manami Soma, the self-defense forces, the military, come in to help assist with the evacuations. And they got an announcement on high, an advisory, that they had to go out to 100 kilometers because they were embedded in coordinating with the American Pacific Command, the American military. And they just abandoned the people in the middle of it. And they were very apologetic. They said, you know, they were following the orders. But, you know, just kind of the common sense reality of what's going on there. I mean, what's important? What are your priorities? And I, I just think people don't really have... That's one of the reasons I think that Nato Khan was actually a very functional prime minister because he was infamously known as, we call him Idaida Irritable Khan. He had made his bones back in the 90s, I guess it was, when there had been a scandal in the health ministry where they weren't properly treating blood products for HIV. And he added his own ministry, which is just absolutely unheard of, as a whistleblower. And then later he ascends through the Democratic Party of Japan to become prime minister. And uh, for him, there were no lanes, and he was annoying everyone. But it ended up being actually very important. I, I've done a lot of interviews on this, both in the Japanese government and the Japanese military and also in the European Union. And I couldn't find anyone who had a positive thing to say about Prime Minister Khan. But because he was kind of a rogue player, he was able to go outside those institutional lanes and routines and be able to, to demand that something get done. Infamously at Fukushima, he prevented the operational staff at Daiichi from abandoning the plant. You know, these are volunteer workers, civilians, and there was a possibility there for a couple of days that if they stayed on site, they might incur fatal doses. And Prime Minister Khan took a helicopter out to the plant, confronted them and said, you're not going anywhere. And that, that probably presented a, a much, prevented a much larger disaster that might have happened. But then when you look at the United States, if nothing else, Trump is a rogue player. I mean, he's an oppositional candidate. He's a grievance candidate. Mm -hmm. His whole thing is anti-institutional anti government. And now that's showing to be, you know, the worst possible stance that you can have in a disaster like this that requires mm -hmm. coordination among the various governments. So to, to get back to the issue of the United States response, what would a functional response look like? I mean, if you were in charge of this and you were laying out the scheme, what would work that's not working now? Are you talking about the, the pandemic specifically? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, here I got to give my limits. I'm not really an epidemiologist or a medical type person. So there's a lot of things the medical uh, side, I, I don't really know all the answers on. But I, I would say this is what it comes down to in a way is the delegation of responsibility and authority and the acceptance of it. That in a really good system, mm -hmm. what you'd have, you would have people at CDC and people at uh, Health and Human Services besides just Dr. Fauci who really know what they're doing and they're going to do the right thing. And the president would be saying to those people, hey, okay, what do we need to do? And they'd say, yeah. Mr. President, here's what you need to do. You have to immediately set up checkpoints at the airports you have to begin the mask and social distancing type thing. You have to meet with the industry leaders and tell them, look at the meatpacking plants and other things. You must immediately institute such and such in order to not have people all be getting sick and stuff. And the president would listen and say, hey, that's that. Yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. And then for anything that wasn't strictly medical, he would turn to he or she would turn to his FEMA director and say, FEMA director, you work with this medical guy here and anything he needs that isn't strictly medical, like talking to the meat packers and stuff like that, get your people out there and do that. But that that's not happening. Instead, it was the other way around where mm -hmm. 
Dr. Fauci famously said, well, we're going to have to do such and such medically or we can't open the schools yet or can't open this yet. And the president says to him, well, that's not acceptable. Well, buddy, the germs don't care. The viruses don't care whether it's acceptable or not. You can't yeah. just say, do this. Well, you have, and, to trust, you have to trust your experts. And it's obviously it's not just with the pandemic. I mean, look, look at uh, the various generals who you know, exited the White House because they've come in conflict with Trump, who has, has said he knows more than the generals about these issues. Right. right so it, right. It's, it's just really bizarre to see people have spent their, you know, really smart, brilliant people have worked their entire career and are genuine specialists in an area to be sidelined by a person who's politicizing absolutely everything from wearing a mask to, you know, what kind of medicine you can take or not take. It's just all become so politicized. It's really a bizarre situation. Well, one thing, I mean, let me just mention, get back on one little, little point here, and this could apply in the pandemic or other disasters, is you said how the, the Japanese have this real overbuilt system, and in a way it is, it's very, very bureaucratic. Um, and sometimes the Japanese people would say to me, well, you Americans are so flexible, you can just go and do this. And I say, actually, no, that's not the case at all. You, it's, it's the exact opposite. We establish a system, but we work it in and actually plan how it's going to work and talk ahead of time. So, for example, uh, one of FEMA's big things during a disaster, a main thing, is working with the other federal agencies like the health agency and so on, the health ministry, as, we call, as you guys call it, on what they're going to do. Well, OK, how are you going to do How is that going to work exactly? So when I was at FEMA in the office I was in, we would assign various staff people way before way before the disaster, this is just during peacetime, to be the liaison with that other federal agency. And my assignment was to the public health service, to the people who are doing the medical teams. And so I knew those people. I would go at least once every couple of weeks. I would take the metro, the subway, and ride out to Rockville, Maryland, and sit down in their staff meetings in the public health service and op disaster preparedness department. So that they got to know me. I knew them. I listened to what they're doing. Well, Leo, if we do this, can FEMA do such and such? And I'd say, tell you what, let me go back and ask my boss, and I'll give you a call back and let you know how that's going to work out. I would talk with them on the phone at least a couple of times a week. And then when the disaster came, we all knew each other. And they could say, oh, Leo, can you get us this? Oh, yeah, fine, I'll get you to that. So it wasn't so much that we were flexible. as that we actually had these pathways that were established not just on paper, but we're actually being done. I mean, the Japanese system is like, okay, you write a medical textbook. Here's how you do surgery. Let's see. Here's how you do surgery on somebody for a doctor. Well, that's great. But now he has to actually go and practice on some dummies or go to some hospitals and work as an intern for a while. He can't just let that medical book sit on the shelf. Then one day they come in and they say, hey, this guy got hit by a car. He needs surgery. And the doc says, well, let me go get this book off the shelf and read and see what it says about that. Hey, man, don't do that. We, we had a system in place. And everybody knew how it worked. And it actually was, it was detailed to the point that at the FEMA headquarters, where we had our disaster headquarters, there would be meetings held at certain times during the day or during the night shift, which would discuss whatever the level of issue was, a team level or agency level, intergovernment level, whatever it was. And these meetings would be held at specific times. And there was a large permanent poster board there in the disaster headquarters that said, okay, Here's what happens at 0700. Here's what happens at 10 o'clock. Here's what happens at 1230. Now, obviously, if there's some major, I don't know, the building catches fire or something, that could be thrown off. But people know what the base is. Oh, at 10 o'clock, we all have to get ready for the such and such meeting. Or at 2 o'clock, the bosses are going to meet, so we got to prepare this information for them. It actually was, in some ways, I don't want to say a rigid system, but a fairly specific system that then everybody understood and everybody knew, and so they could work in very quickly. So when the disaster comes, Leo, me, I'm expected to work closely with the medical guys during the disaster. Now, if the energy guys are there and the Coast Guard guys are there and the agriculture guys are there, yeah, we knew it. We all say, hi, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? But there's somebody else who's working with them. I work with the medical people. And that kind remember, of system, I think, worked. I remember that you had said something along the lines of, the day of the disaster is not the time that you should be getting phone numbers and uh, contact. How did you put that? Yeah, that's actually, that was not for me. That was from somebody or others. It's like an, an old saying. Anybody in disasters in the U.S. can tell you 
the day of the disaster is not the day to be exchanging business cards. Right. You should have pre-existing relationships that you can rely on. Exactly. And and those those are at all levels. Those are at the at the senior persuasive levels. When when James Lee Wood was the head of FEMA, the FEMA executives at regional level and various levels, they spent a lot of time going around to the states and sitting in with meetings with the state government people and talking to them what FEMA did, learning what they did, et cetera. And James Lee Witt became well known. So if you had a situation in a pandemic and someplace in Idaho or Iowa, there was a question about the meatpacking plants, you could expect that either the FEMA regional director for that region, or if it's serious enough, James Lee would get on the telephone and be talking to the governor or talking to the emergency director and saying, hi, look, at this is James Lee. I see your situation. We really think you ought to do such and such. And this governor would also know because James Lee had become, because of his competence of really fixing up FEMA, he became sort of a well-known national figure. And it was like that there used to be a TV commercial for, I think it was E.F. Hutton, some stock brokerage. And these guys are sitting in a restaurant talking. And one of them says, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And he says, and the whole restaurant gets quiet. They all know what did E.F. Hutton say. Right. And that was a little bit of James Lee Witt, that if James Lee Witt says, you really ought to do this with the meatpacking plants, and they don't, and that gets into the papers. People are going to say, hey, man, Mr. Witt yeah. told you what you were supposed to do. Why didn't you do it? Yeah. But he couldn't just do that out of his back pocket. He had to spend years building that reputation and those contacts yeah. as yeah, all of authority. us did. Yeah. yeah. So so what we're seeing in the United States certainly is a lack of continuity between governments. I mean, you could not have a more stark contrast between the Obama administration and the Trump administration. and yet. At a bureaucratic level, you know, it's all politicized. But when you start going down into the agencies like CDC, FEMA, et cetera, I mean, these are people like yourself who have worked in, you know, various government administration. Michael Osterholm at University of Minnesota, who alongside Fucci is one of the world's authority on mm-hmm. infectious disease. I think he's worked in five different presidential administrations. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, those are the experts. And it, it's really sad that um, in a situation like this that, you know, sometimes the least competent people are the persons that are making the decisions that affect everyone. Just just briefly yeah. saying that while it's pretty bad right now in the U.S., the bureaucracy, which I believe in, is is actually still there. And if we have a new president and new appointees coming in next year, a lot of those people who work at the Environmental Protection Agency, who work at FEMA and so on at the working levels, are all going to say, oh, this is great, now we can all get back to work again. So the system is there. The system can be restarted. I think fairly quickly if we get some good people in charge at the top next year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that well, let's hope. I mean, and Leo, I really appreciate your generosity and having spoken to my students in previous classes and taking the time this evening. Uh, and I hope to see you back over here in Japan if you, you have the me, opportunity. You and me both, Kyle. Okay, well, thanks so much, Leo. I appreciate oh, your time. Take care. Thanks for joining us today. This podcast is an initiative of the Institute of Contemporary Asian Studies at Temple University Japan campus. To learn more about the Institute, please visit www.tuj.ac.jp forward slash ICAS. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast for the next episode. Thanks for listening and see you next time.